You're listening to KWOU. Coming up next, the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilius Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. Relax. Everything is going to be fine. Take a deep breath and hold it. Are you still holding it? Hi, I'm still Jasper Beck, and this is The Amazing Unbelievable Adventures of Dr. Theophilius Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. Previously, in this unbelievable tale, some things happened. They don't matter. They're gone now. They have gone, now, as everything has. They hasn't. It's hazardous to think otherwise, wise to overthink what a hazard is. Do my words confuse you? Good. Me too. Now, where were we? We were here, at this bar, the world just shy of 121 days from ending, when asked what their reaction was to this literally earth-shaking news, the characters had this to say. Loose. Honestly, I was kind of expecting this to happen. At the very least, now my general ennui about everything is somewhat justified. No better time to be falling apart when the world is too. No better time to let yourself go when the whole world is letting go too. Mrs. Hatter. I'm certainly not letting go. I have things to do and places to be. People to meet who are capital I important, so important, in fact, that their very identities and purposes to my character development in this show yet remain painstakingly vague. I'll be damned if the end of the world gets in the way of my schedule. Matt Brown. Gotta side with the hat lady on this one. What difference does it make if the world's ending or not? You go on living the same. Speaking from a professionally vampiric perspective, I don't have much faith in the legitimacy of the prophecy anyway, so... What we've been given here essentially amounts to a far-off weather forecast for light rain and heavy oblivionation, so, which may or may not be accurate. No cause for alarm, and certainly no cause for days off work. The turtle, who doesn't matter. Ah, it uh, seems his mic has been disconnected. Oh well. Matt Brown. Well, in the interest of moving this story forward, or rather simply moving this story, the direction doesn't matter. If you'd like, the story could just sort of vibrate in place. Most people really can't tell the difference. In any case, I've got a client to meet at next enough in a few hours. Want to come? We could even mark it down as a job shadow. For it is well known that vampires have no shadows unless they officially mark it down. The both of you would make swell vampires. Mrs. Hatter. Well, how convenient is that? One of the aforementioned painstakingly vague people I was talking about lives in Nexeneth. We could kill two birds with one stone. Matt Brown. I love killing birds with stones. Loose. And I love having little to no character motivation. It really makes it easy for me to just go places on a whim. Shall we go there on a whim? I don't think walking in purple weather is a good idea, especially after poetry. And now that Mrs. Hatter's carriage is unusable, after what that large anthropomorphic woodlouse did to it, Mrs. Hatter. You promised never to speak of that again. Narrator, thank you for your interview, but we must be going now. And they left. The turtle, who, as it has been indicated in a recent peer-reviewed study, matters exponentially less the more he's mentioned, following close behind them. Narrating just barely pays the bills these days, so I most likely can't afford to go to Nexenuth on a whim. I'll have to wait for the next publicly available legitimate reason to roll around and catch up with them once I've gotten there as usual. In the meantime, I think I'll treat myself to a drink here at Crokey Dan's Smoky Downtown Poetry Bar, purveyor of mediocre beverages, bad poetry, and grade A smokiness. Bartender, got any happiness in a bottle? Smoky Dan waddled over. Sorry, Mr. Narrator, we've been fresh out of happiness for a long time now. Supply just se can't seem to keep up with the demand. Well, maybe people will realize that there are uh, plenty of other interesting things to drink besides happiness. Nah, I doubt it. Will delirium do the trick? With an irony chaser, that'll do just fine. Who needs happiness anyway? I do, said a small voice at the other end of the room. Oh, shut up, Fuchsia. You shut up, croaky Dan. I need happiness. I'm dying here. All for a drop, just a single drop of happiness. 
I haven't seen one in years. I'm not even sure the tongue between my teeth would recognize happiness if it drowned in it now. Don't I deserve it, Crokey Dan? Don't I deserve it, Mr. Narrator Man? Would you laugh at my desiccated soul and say, Oh well, you can lead a horse to water, but there's no drop to drink. This old town's been dry ever since it was promised to be the land of opportunity. You know that. Like rats fleeing a sinking stomach, people flock to this establishment to liquidate their funds and to liquid fun. Because as soon as that promise was made, they knew soon it would be broken. That's what promises are for. Maybe if we had simply remained Billsworth Bridges, then happiness wouldn't have run out. People would have, wouldn't have been expecting nothing, and they wouldn't have been chasing after happiness like the hollow husk that now stands before you. And as I grab your collar, you may yell and holler for help, but Mr. Narrator Man, you know full well you ain't helped nobody but yourself. You know what, Mr. Narrator Man, I think you're right. There are plenty of other interesting things to drink besides happiness. Things like hatred and pain and rage. And boy, am I thirsty. As Fuchsia's newfound fangs plunged into my neck, I narrated the violence in past tense to deprive it of its power. There was not much I could do to fight back, as it is well known that vampires are at their strongest at, as newborns, when their general antipathy towards life is yet undiluted by the feminine wiles of Mother Earth. It was honestly quite moving, witnessing up close the earnest ferocity with which she ended my life. It gave me hope for the future of the vampiric industry, and for the youth of the world in general. Perhaps, in their undeath, they would bring new life to this rapidly decaying dollar store bouquet of a world we found ourselves in. I was in tears. I was in shock. I was. And before I knew it, I wasn't. And that's how I died. You think this is over? The death of the narrator was only the beginning. The death of the author is next. I'm coming for you, Jasper Beck. You will regret writing me into this story. Uh, hi, I'm the new guy from uh, Central Narrating. I was sent here with a report that the previous narrator was unreliable. Yeah, that's about right. Not that anything he said was ever proven to be false, but I just never did trust him. Well, yeah, that would uh, make him unreliable. We're, we're sorry for the inconvenience. We have a narrative guarantee to replace any and all narrators that aren't satisfying our clientele. That's uh, why I'm here. So, uh, if you don't mind, would you like to fill out a short customer survey about your experiences with your previous narrator? It helps us maintain quality service and enters you into the raffle for an epilogue. Well, shoot, hand her over. Great. Okay, first day on the job, I'd better hop to it. Thanks again for your help. Hey, not a problem. Feel free to stop by any time. The, uh, tragedy that occurred here at Crooky Dan's Smoky Downtown Poetry Bar was, in a word, tragic. It would be surely remembered by the local peoples as one of the many examples of the fallout following the cities of Billsworth Bridges rechristening as the land of opportunity. Perhaps in time, the weight of such tragedies as these would soften the hearts of the city's leadership, leading to the bountiful return of a steady supply of happiness. Or perhaps it was too late to change, and the dousing crowds of hollow husks would rise up in anger to proverbially eat the metaphorically rich doing away with the bleary-eyed moniker and restoring a kind of stoic clarity to the humble city's condition. We may never know, because it was at that exact moment, dear listeners, for reasons still unknown, that the entirety of the shining city of Billsworth Bridges' land of opportunity exploded in a violent explosion that exploded in a similar fashion to how one particular explosion had exploded before. Every Billsworth, every bridge, every opportunity in the land burst forth in incendiary brilliance. Croaky Dan Smoky Downtown Poetry Bar, which, as it turns out, was the only building in the entire city, was catapulted into the heavens by a colossal tree of fire, its trunk shooting feet feverishly upward, its billowing canopy of debris in full bloom, and its cracked roots choking the life out of earth itself as she begged breathlessly for mercy. And as Croaky Dan's hopes and dreams sailed into that infinite horizon, the tree bore fruit. And all who ate of the fruit would surely die. 
You need the comfort of my assurance that this has nothing to do with anything. You need that release from the weight of things mattering. It's a kind of cold and empty security, like the basement closet of an abandoned building. I only want to make you happy, but, or rather, therefore, I cannot let you stay locked away there. Come on out. I know you can see the beam of yellowish light trickling through the crack in the door. Things matter. Stare them in the face, the ending of Billsworth Bridges, land of oblivion, the rapturous planting of a tree of fire, all of this, I assure you, has everything to do with everything. You cannot escape that. You cannot escape the fact that you're listening to KWOU. Pray you do not forget this in the interlude, for the poem that comes after will not be kind if you do. Consider this hill on which we sit. Consider it a friend. Fence-sitters we pretend to be will meet our fitting end. Since birth the hill hath overlooked the lovely oaks below, now buildings block the wind, it whines about the blackish billows. Consider the winds to which we threw our caution, coughing into hands we warm with coffee. Where did all the time go? Into sand we caught and filled our glasses with cheer on tap. Here whichever chap can drink the longest buys the next round. The heart is fondest hard, expounding the virtues of her choosing, pounding at a tune. Her shoes are soon worn thin from her abuse of her soul, sinking deep into the recesses of where she's afraid to go. Could you wander back my way? I fear it's still unknown, the relation between us two. I trust you with every bone in my body that hasn't been removed and locked away in my chest. I swear I don't even know the combination, knowing such a temptation. That's why ignorance is blistering from all the friction between truth and stranger fiction. Fix me before I shift into neutral about the whole thing. If I squander it, why stay? Consider this hill on which we sit. It doesn't care for you or I. It doesn't care that you said you loved me or that I'm still scared that you were right. It simply is, implying nothing, pliable to our child's hands, scooping sand into our glasses, classic case of curse of man. We handle the hill and it takes it in stride. We strut and sift and see inside, documenting awkwardly to keep us occupied. Pining for the pines behind buildings, looming a cloth round our eyes. I've been pondering all day. What if you wandered back my way? Matt Brown walks down the front steps of Bartleby Manor, breathing heavily in gratitude for his existence. Luce and Mrs. Hatter follow behind him, breathing heavily in fear of passing out. The turtle who does not matter is eating a BLT, breathing heavily in indifference towards his existence. The narrator is addressing the audience, breathing heavily in anticipation of what will happen next. The audience sits in rapt attention in the dark, breathing heavily in annoyance at the broken ventilation system. They are all breathing, together in unison, here in the town of Nexanath. The town of Nexanath is next to nothing, breathing heavily in defiance of the void. People go about their days in light of the dark, in full awareness of their location, situated on the precipice of everything into abject notness. Every pause is pregnant, every house is full, and every vampire walks down the front steps of Bartleby Manor, breathing heavily in boredom for the meaningless repetition of seemingly meaningful phrases. 
Despite that loop we were just caught in now, I think this most recent killing has really restored my faith in my profession. Not that a vampire would ever have faith, but if they were to, they would certainly have it in their profession, said Matt Brown, a spring in his step and a rock in his shoe. I suppose it just took meeting the right person. Some people are simply much more skilled at dying than others. He glanced at Luce expectantly with a pregnant pause. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Under different circumstances, I probably would have performed better, but lately I just can't seem to do anything right. I'm sorry if I wasted your time. Matt Brown pats the mildly sad man on the back. Don't worry. It's not my time to waste. It's company time. Which reminds me, as my shadows, how would you rate this first experience? I'm happy to answer any questions. Mrs. Hatter gestured towards the blood trailing behind them up the steps. So, did Mr. Bartleby request a vampire, or did your superiors send you here to kill him? Neither. I do what I want. Right. I suppose, then, I'm just mildly confused as to the structure or purpose of your company and the vampiric industry in general. Luce is mildly sad, you're mildly confused, and I'm mildly glad you asked that question. My employers are part of a long and proud history of exsanguination services that date back almost 1,111 and a half years before the Adastrian War. There has always been a large demand for death, example A, the aforementioned Adastrian War, and similarly titled atrocities, and we vampires are happy to create a supply for it. Whether it's an enemy, a friend, a family, or even an indulgent purchase for yourself. My colleagues and I will deliver quality service in record time with competitive prices. That makes sense, says the turtle, not mattering, but not caring that he didn't matter because he had a BLT, and that's pretty much as good as it gets. Why is there a toll-free number next to you? Who are you talking to? Death. You just can't live without it. This is stupid. I don't even know the name of this company that you claim to work for. It seems to me you're just making things up to justify your joy-killing. The best companies don't have names, Mrs. Hatter. They have ideals. Monetizable ideals. And I work for them, yes, but I never said I was any good at following protocol. Quite the opposite, in fact. I just got a message from my manager. She says she wants to meet with me about my conduct in the workplace. You know what that means. What does it mean? It means you get to have an awesome backstory-exploring solo adventure while I tried not to get fired. So, as the Parapolipians say, blah, 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 and with a flash and a half, he was gone. You know what? No, I don't even feel like it. Luce, you want to go get drinks? There can't be a happiness drought in every town. L Luce? A passing legitimate reason soared down the streets while flocks of whims wiggled overhead. People shuffled by as buildings chatted about the weather, rushing off the void that their needle tops scraped so incredulously. A couple somersaulted in the crosswalk, dragons embraced in the street. A disheveled doctor and a slightly undersized emu hitchhiked in the back of a watermelon truck as traffic of all shapes, sizes, and emotional maturity levels swam up and down the corridors of the great and industrial Nexenuth complex, searching for a sign that they had already passed at the last intersection. A turtle munched a BLT. In other words, the city moved on, Mrs. Hatter. It does not wait for you as you stand decisively indecisive. If you wish to remain a mildly confused monolith, the city will grow around you like moss. Do you wish to be mossy? Mrs. Hatter shook her hatted head. Well then, I suggest an alternative. You must grow with the city. Story is about growth, and contrary to that vampire's oft heretical words, you can tell the difference between a story that is moving and a story that is vibrating in place. You're scared to change because you enjoy the hum that all this cacophony gives off. You harmonize with it, singing a sweet song of stasis. You don't want the song to end. You don't want the chord to resolve, but need I remind you, my dear Mrs. Hatter. A kind old cat person walks by and says, In a hundred and twenty days now, the world will end, and walks away. It's not up to you to decide if and or when the song ends. 
This whole endeavor of yours of standing still is built upon that false assumption. This whole city is built upon the recognition of that, and look where they are now. Next to nothing. Sounds like an insult, doesn't it? But then again, isn't everything an insult? To what? I don't know. But that's the point. Many things are hidden from the eyes within our ears, but some things aren't. The buildings stepped aside, and a capital I important place appeared before Mrs. Hatter, a small cluster of huts interconnected by greenhouse halls and stepping stone walkways. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Hatter. I only want the best for you. Mrs. Hatter took a deep breath and sighed through the noise. She collected herself, said farewell to the turtle, and sprinted in the opposite direction of the huts. Oh boy, this isn't going to be easy. Can we cut to a meanwhile? Meanwhile, Fuchsia is traipsing around the desert that surrounds what used to be the shining city of Billsworth Bridges, land of somewhat controversial opportunity. Despite all her efforts, she is still as thirsty as ever. Shut up, Jasper! I hate you! You made me this way! While this is technically true, Fuchsia fails to comprehend the complex relationship the author has to their creations, and how a static, linear model of meaning is insufficient to describe both the reality and joy of the creative process. I forgive Fuchsia for that, though, because even if she were to comprehend it, people are not made of comprehension alone. They're made of ooey-gooey emotions like spite and short-sighted bitterness, which are not necessarily to be eradicated by some kind of superior cold enlightenment. The whole must be embraced, with all of its shortcomings and longcomings. That's easy for you to say. You have the luxury of hovering over my suffering without ever having to experience it. While you sit in your armchair, chuckling to yourself over some mediocre wordplay, I'm dying here by your hand. Actually, I'm currently in one of those plastic school chairs as I'm writing this, which are not very comfortable at all, which may actually be the function of their design to begin with, but I digress. The point is, Fuchsia, things are not so simple between you and I. I do not have the luxury of simply hover hovering over your suffering, and you do not have the luxury of declaring a one-to-one -one linear cause for that suffering. More accurately, though not totally, your suffering simply is, or rather, complicatedly is. We're in this together, you and I. Neither of us can stake our flags before or after each other's, because nothing is before or after a sphere. We are a sphere, Fuchsia, hovering in the brainscape alone. You don't have to trust me, but in a way, you have to trust me. I only want the best for you. Fuchsia put her unheaded head in her hands. She began to weep. The world seemed to her the piercing screech of grinding incongruent forces, with her in between. My head hurts, Jasper. My head hurts. Yeah, mine does too. Just tell me everything is going to be okay. It's going to be okay, Fuchsia. I got you. I got you. I see in you what you cannot yet see in yourself, and what I see is beautiful. Thanks, Jasper. Anytime, Fuchsia. I'm proud of you. And with that, Fuchsia got up, dusted herself off, and ran, far away from the desert she had been in for so long, and into the sunset like so many stories gone by. Of course, this doesn't mean at all her story's over, it's just a nice picture in my mind. She'll be back. But, for now, she's running. You know who's also running? Mrs. Hatter. Turns out the... With the wind behind you, a particularly large hat can act, actually act as a sail, propelling you at great speeds away from the narrative that's been set up for you, 
towards nowhere in particular, which used to be its own independent city, but it's now just a suburb district of Nexeneth. She's been running for a while now, leaping over pedestrians and equestrians and questioning the mess she's in. Everywhere she looks, she seems to see those humble huts, patiently waiting for her to come back around. She screamed, No! and kept running. She outran the wind, she outran the city, she outran the tears down her face. This was not a good look for her, and looks were her everything. She looked angry, she looked desperate, she looked terrified. She looked away. She's in the suburbs now, walking, then jogging two steps, then walking, then shuddering incontrollably, then walking. The houses and their greenish lawns looked on in pity, opening their mouths to say something but not knowing what. Grandma set down her tea and teeters down the front steps. Can I help you, young lady? The lady with the very large hat smiled in pain. Yes, I would love to come in for some tea if you have a moment. Grandma opened the front door. Water still hot. Mrs. Hatter hurried inside, and Grandma shut the door. They're drinking tea now, in the dining room, soft light pouring in from the windows overlooking the backyard, the grandchildren at play. Grandma let the silence brew for a few minutes before taking a sip of conversation. She knew how these sorts of things worked. How long have you been running, dear? Too long. The tea was still hot. I see. Is this your uh, first visit to Nexeneth? Yes. N n no. It, uh, it's, it's been a very long time. Hmm. Do you have friends you're traveling with? No. Y y yes, they're, they're just... They're just some people I met. Hmm. I've always enjoyed meeting people. Especially traveling. You get to sort of collect them, like a scrapbook. You say, look, there's so-and-so. I met them on my way to such-and-such, and we had a wonderful time together. It's those little moments you come to treasure most. <laughs> yes, well, I'm not much of a people person myself, so I suppose my scrapbook is uh, largely empty. <laughs> Well, that's okay. That just means you can use it as a journal to write your story. I don't have a story. Everyone has a story. Then I don't want a story! All of this doesn't make any sense. I never asked for any of this. I don't want my past to come back to haunt me. I don't want some mysterious stranger to send me on a journey to find myself. I want to live. Is that too much to ask? To be my own person instead of being shoved around by my story? Well, don't you dare dispense some timeless saying or rhetorical question. I did not come here to have my conflict resolved by the wise old woman. I am fine. And if everybody would just accept that, maybe my life wouldn't be a living hell. Grow up. I am not your protagonist or anyone's. I am me. I'm going to leave now before you say something profound. Thank you for the tea. And she left. Grandma sighed. She had many things to say, but no reason to say them. She shrugged her shoulders and went to entertain the grandchildren in the backyard. Who was that, Grandma? She sounds mean. Her accent sounds funny. Your face sounds funny. Hey, Grandma! Settle down, settle down. She was just lost. She sounds like she was downright miserable. That she was mostly because she hasn't quite figured out that she is downright miserable. Not yet, at least. Maybe she'll come back around. Grandma, you want to play freeze tag? And they played freeze tag all afternoon. Tune in next week for the next episode. Every once in a while, in the wee hours of the morning, I'll find myself staring into the mirror and muttering, I'm Jasper Beck, and this is The Amazing Unbelievable Adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. 
You're listening to KWOU.